Say, this is my Bible. I believe. It is God Almighty in written form. And today, it will enter my heart, my mind, my emotions, and my body, conforming me to the image of Jesus Christ, to the glory of the Father. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, again, it just, uh, whew, just really sense Jesus. Amen. Uh, we've been talking about the glory of God. And then uh, last Sunday we shared that you know, it's all about God. And maybe that's the title of this uh, message would be, it really would fit it. You know, we talked about in our own selves we're unqualified. Amen. But through Jesus, we are qualified. Through his blood, his Holy Spirit, through the new nature, through the new birth, through his word, through his name, amen, we're qualified. Hallelujah. And uh, I just pray that the uh, you know, Holy, Holy Spirit will just minister as what you need to hear, amen. I believe God's desire in this church, in any church, in every church that's seeking God, is to bring us into a place as never before where we see who God is because it's so easy really to minimize God. So easy because we bring him in our mindset, amen, and our realm of thinking and instead of him bringing us into his realm of thinking. And uh, I've had people when we say, you know, we're praying for people to be healed, uh, maybe somebody that's... Uh, you know, the manga Lord, and we've seen God touch kids like this and change them, and, or, or somebody, man, that, that just, man, they don't have legs or whatever. And it's like, well, you can't do that. Or, you know, and I've had more pastors, you know, you're just out of your mind. And I, of course, I always say, no, I'm just out of your mind. But it's so important to be out of the mind of the natural, isn't it? Because God's not in the, God is spirit. Amen? The reason we're born again is so we could get out of the natural mind, amen, and enter into the mind of Christ. And I tell you, his mind's a whole lot better than ours. Amen? Glory to God. Now, his kingdom's somewhat of an upside-down kingdom. Misty Edwards has a really good song, you know, the upside-down kingdom, but, you know, to, if you want to be seen, you have to not want to be seen. If you want to, you know, enter in to increase, you have to give what you have, you know what I'm saying? It's an upside-down kingdom, but I tell you, it's an awesome kingdom. Amen. All right. So we're wanting to enter in to just to understand, you know, some of the word about pressure. We want to put the pressure on God and not on us in a good way. In the sense that, man, it's like with ministry. We can plant, we can water, but it's only God that can give increase. Amen. Really, it's all about God. And this is like the title, that it's all about God. No, we have our part to play. But it's a small part. Amen. It's a diathiki covenant. In the Hebrew, one of the words for covenant is diathiki, D-I-A-T-H-E-K-I. And it's a lopsided covenant. And we do have our part to play. You know, when God is saying, hey, do this, do this, we, we need to do it with joy. When God's saying, give this up, it's not right, we need to give it up. Amen. We need to say yes to him. Glory to God. We need to uh, let him, you know, flow through us. The Bible says, in 1 Thessalonians 5, do not quench the spirit. It says, do not forbid to prophesy. It says, do not forbid to speak in tongues. Well, so often, I mean, why did the Bible say that? Because so many people do. And so we have to cooperate with the Lord. But we have to see that we give him ourselves and he does the rest. Amen? And I tell you, that's what real grace is under victory. So, uh, Last week, we shared again, we're unqualified in ourselves. We shared about the apostles and how they were human just like us. They made many mistakes. They entered into times of selfishness. Uh, they entered into times of unbelief. But Jesus was patient with them. Amen? And he brought them forth. Glory to God. You know, one of the things that Peter struggled with most was... He didn't understand that Jesus had to die. You know, one moment, you know, God says, man, you're the only, you got this great revelation of who I am. Man, I'm going to build my church on this revelation you have. And 
Man, the next moment he's saying, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You know what I'm saying? Because Peter actually, when Jesus started talking about going to the cross, took Jesus aside. But he didn't do it publicly. Wasn't that nice of him? Just took him aside. Have you ever done that with God to tell him, you know, he wasn't doing something right? And we all probably have done that. He said, Master, you really don't have to die. And, and, that, and, and, and then that's why he entered into denying Jesus. He was confused. He was frustrated. He was not cowardly. He took, off his, he took his sword, cut off the ear, the high priest, to, to kill him. He wasn't cowardly. But he was deceived in that context. But Peter's the same one. When you read in Acts 3 and Acts 4, man, he's the one that preaches the gospel, how Jesus had to die. He's the one that shared the message that he did not understand. He's the one that shared the message that he didn't believe in. Amen? God can take us from one place and he can put us in another. Amen? Glory to Jesus. Love is patient. And God is very patient with us. Glory to God. And at the end of this message, we're going to share a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant and how it's a type of the believer. And, uh, but the Ark was made of Achaia wood, probably the worst wood to make anything from. It was bent. It was knotted. But it's a type of us. Man, when we're saved, you know, we, our spirit gets saved, but man, we got a lot of things to... Man, our soul needs to get free. Our soul needs to be washed. Our soul needs to be restored, renewed. Amen? Glory to God. All right. So uh, we looked at Gideon and uh, how he, you know, he looked cowardly, felt cowardly. And God came to him and said, oh, great and mighty warrior. And Gideon became one of the strongest men really ever recorded in the Bible. He had, a long, he had the longest tenure of any of the judges. You know, greater than Samson, greater than anyone, 40 years. And, you know, if God came to you right now, what do you believe he'd say? I, I believe he'd say, man, I see my son in you. I see destiny. I see victory. And that's what, when we read the word, that's what he's speaking to us. Amen? So God wants us to see ourselves through him in the context of destiny. And he wants us to understand at the same time that our job, it is about grace. It's following Jesus. It's letting Jesus flow in us, through us, and for us. Amen? Glory to God. It's a simple message, but I tell you what, when the tire hits the road, and man, you're in front of somebody, and they've got four-stage cancer, and I forgot to say, you know, we got... Good reports from the healing service. Again, I appreciate so much everyone that helped minister it and prayed for it. Uh, someone that Kathy and I helped disciple years ago in, in campus ministry. Uh, her daughter had difficult situation physically, and she called up Kathy uh, yesterday and said, you know what? For the first time in years, I have hope. She said, when hands were laid on me, I don't even know who prayed for her. I can't remember. It's not important. But... She said, I felt Jesus in a way I have never felt him before. I felt Jesus in a way I have never felt Jesus before. She's a pastor's wife, just loves the Lord. But man, amen, glory to God. But when we're in need, when you love somebody in need, uh, you know what I'm saying? I, I, again, it's about we need their agreement. At the same time, man, you find out it's not about you. You can't give them a word of knowledge unless God gives it to you. Amen? You can't give them the right scripture unless God gives it to you. You can't give them the wisdom that they need unless God gives it to you. And you surely can't bring about the power that's necessary to remedy the situation. Whether it's emotional healing, physical healing, or uh, uh, encouragement or exhortation. Again, our job, glory to God, is man is to let Jesus reign in us, through us and for us. Amen? And that's exciting. I used to have, uh, you know, I, I like T-shirts, bumper stickers, plaques that say different things. And it says, if God is your co-pilot, man, switch seats. You know what I'm saying? 
God wants us. He needs our agreement. Amen? But come on, let him fly the plane. Amen? Now, he may fly it through you, but he's the one that's flying it. Amen? I do not want to be on a plane, glory to God, that I'm flying myself. Would you want on a plane that I'm flying? That, that came a little too quick. All right. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Yeah, I have a hard time driving my car. Drove it into the side of a ditch before I came out here today. But God, amen. But amen. I'm a good co-pilot. All right. I'm not driving a plane, though. All right. Amen. But isn't that the truth, though? We need to let Jesus drive the plane. Really, glory to God. He's an awesome pilot. I've shared this before, but it's so true. You know, how many people have been in Niagara Falls? Yeah, most of us here. Okay. You know, I'm amazed, you know, I, I think it's tempting God, but these people, there's one guy that literally drove across the falls on a bicycle. You know, are you kidding me? But uh, someone was sharing, you know, that you know, there was somebody that said, man, I believe you could drive across that, you know, the falls backwards in that bicycle. Man, I think you're amazing. I'm so confident in you, you could do it 10 times a day if you wanted and the guy that rode the bicycle across the fall says, you know what? You're just the person I'm looking for because I have a two-seater. <laughs> Amen. And then his, somehow he wasn't so confident. Amen. But we need to be confident. Amen. God has a two-seater. Amen. He's doing the driving, but he needs our agreement. Amen. Glory to God. All right. That's the key to what we want to say. So we talked a lot about Gideon. All right. Go with me to Exodus uh, 33, we'll see how far we get in this and, and uh, examples. In the context of Moses and Joshua, there's a really interesting principle. It's a type. Obviously, Moses wasn't God. Uh, Joshua wasn't Jesus, but Joshua's name in the Hebrew, of course, is Yeshua, which means salvation, but he's a type of Jesus, obviously not Jesus. But in Exodus 33, you know, verse 11 says, Lord spoke unto Moses face to face. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? As a man speaks unto a friend. Mm, Jesus. Hallelujah. And then it goes on to say that, uh, man, after he would uh, just be in the Ark of the Covenant, that, that he'd, and after he'd be in the presence of God, in the presence of God, Joshua wouldn't go away. He stayed in the presence of God. And Joshua became a great man and, uh, because he learned so much from Moses. I mean, Joshua, you know, Moses obviously crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. Wow. And Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. Joshua 10. I mean, that's power. Amen. In the sense that now he's the one that didn't stop the sun. The Bible says God heard him. He hearkened unto his voice. And obviously he stopped it for almost a whole day so he could avenge himself. Amen, of their enemies. So Joshua entered in to so much of, of what Moses had. And there's a verse in Deuteronomy. It, it talks about impartation. And it's a type of how Jesus imparts his life to us. But in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So here's what's interesting. Moses sowed unto this wisdom. Moses sowed and sowed and sowed and he entered in. The Bible says he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And was, had some great in wisdom. But then Joshua, who didn't sow in the fullness of Moses, in this context. And Moses lays his hands on him. And all the wisdom within Moses is now in Joshua. Wow. It's a principle of impartation. And, we, you know, there's so much involved in this. And, uh, wow, and that's grace. What you didn't sow to, you receive because of someone else. It's, again, it's a type of the gospel. Okay, we're going to give a few more examples of this. Man, there's so much here. But go with me now to uh, David. We're going to look at him, 1 Samuel 16. 
And most of us know the story of David and Goliath, but let's look at the root of how David entered in to really, really destroying, amen, the, uh, that. Glory to God. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says, Samuel took the horn of oil, which represents, the oil represents the person and power of the Holy Spirit. And this is in the context of impartation as well. And anointed him in the midst of his brethren. That's pretty strong. This expression, I tell you, there's a lot here. You know, David had older brothers. They were very strong in battle. But David is the one that was anointed. There's something about David that God gravitated towards. And because he was seeking God. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And the Bible says that the anointing oil went into David and graced him, enabling him to do things he could never, ever, ever even think of doing on his own. And it's a type of the Holy Spirit in us who the oil represents. And if we just get that reality, it'll change our life. So David, now, after he's anointed, man, a bear comes into his, you know, he's tending sheep and tries to, you know, takes one of the sheep and with his hands, he kills the bear. Wow. And then a lion comes, takes a sheep, and David rescues the sheep out of his mouth. And then when the lion attacked David, David destroys that lion. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Amen? Wow. And this is the old covenant, but same Holy Spirit. But he wasn't in him, but he was on him. And back then, you know, he wasn't on everybody. He was on the king, uh, the prophet. Amen? Oh, Jesus. And the priest, high priest. But man, that's powerful. So when man, Goliath is, you know, comes and is intimidating, you know, the Israelites. I mean, it was crazy. The Israelites would get up in armor array. They would worship. They would shout. They would do everything but go out into battle. Wow. But David comes up a young man. It's not about age. It's not about gender. It's not about Man, it's not about education. It's about Jesus. It's about the anointing. And he says, man, I've killed the bear. I've killed the lion. Surely the spirit of God will come upon me again to destroy the, this guy that's trying to usurp the authority of God himself and destroy us. Glory to God. He's confident not in himself. He was confident in the anointing. Amen. And, uh, you know, we know the story. I mean, he took the, the five stones from the creek. And I, I believe it represents fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But also, the Bible says that Goliath had four brothers. So maybe that was part of it as well. So, and with a slingshot. I mean, the devil thought he had, you know, Goliath covered. And Goliath just had one opening. And man, the Spirit of God guided that. Stone went right into his head. Man, this, you know, Goliath falls to the ground. But David still didn't have a sword. But his armor bearer had a huge sword. But David goes up. And man, the armor bearer just drops the sword and takes off. David takes the armor bearer's sword and cuts off his head. Amen. That's what we need to do to the enemy. Amen. Glory to God. And we can. See, this is what God wants us to see. Not because of who we are, but who's in us. Amen? Glory to Jesus. Be strong and courageous. The word in us and courageous because of the word that causes us to have faith in him. Amen. But here's what I want us to come to see is this. 2 Samuel 23 it talks about the last words of David. 
And he was a great man, and this is before he's going to go to, to paradise. Second Samuel 23, it says, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, spoke. The man who was raised up on high. It's a derivative of El Elyon. God will raise us up on high to be like the eagles, not like the crows. The anointed of the God of Jacob. He lived by the anointing. The same anointing that raised Jesus from the dead. He lived by the anointing. The sweet psalmist of Israel. He said, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my tongue. And I tell you, the spirit of God fought through him. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. So he's talking before he dies. He's attributing what he did. Amen to the anointing of God. And if you want to be used by God, if you want to walk in victory with your God, amen, we need to get our eyes off ourselves, out of the natural and onto God. Amen? Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Doesn't say greater are you in your natural mind because of our great giftings or how much you try, how religious you are. It talks about greater is he. In us. Glory to God. Now again, yeah, God wants us to, to be righteous, to do what we're supposed to do, but we need to understand. Man, life is only comes when we do it through the anointing of God. All right? So David, in this uh, passage 23, it talks about the men of David. His, those he discipled. It's talking about the legacy that he left. And the Bible actually says in the book of Amos, in the last days, God's going to restore the tabernacle of David. What's the tabernacle of David? It's when Saul, he was king and he reigned without the ark, without the spirit of God. And when David became king, he said, man, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to bring back the ark. Because the ark, the spirit of God is everything. Man, how can you rule without the Spirit of God? But he did, and that's why he fell. So, amen. So that's a very powerful prophecy. So let's look. These men, and you have to remember, the Bible says that these men that David discipled, they were men that had a, they had a lot of issues. They said most of them were poor, they were in debt, they, they were sick, they, were, they had all kinds of problems. And they actually lived in a cave, in an area, in caves, because David was running from Saul. But man, something on David got on them. And see, this is, when we go, man, when Jesus is in our lives, man, something about him gets in us, amen? Through the Spirit of God. But listen to what happens to these guys. Old Testament men. These be the, in verse 8, these be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmonite that sat in the city was chief among the captains, the three. It says, the same was he. He lifted up his spear against 800 men and slew them at one time. That is, I mean, it is so impossible. It is ridiculously impossible. You got 800 Hundred men. And this guy destroys 800 men by himself with one spear. It had to be through the anointing of God. Amen? See, the Bible says the works that Jesus did, we will do also. But to me, much more importantly, the intimacy that Jesus had with the Father. According to John 17, we can enter into by the Spirit of God, by grace, by the blood of Jesus, by the gift of righteousness. So these men, David imparted something to them by the grace of God. 800 men at one time. And then it says, uh, you know, there was another man that, you know, did something similar against the Philistines. And then there was a, certain, a third man who was, a, you know, one of the top three, if you keep reading. There's a ground full of lentils, verse 11. And 
the Philistines came against it. And he stood in the midst of the lentils when everybody flew, they, they all, flew, you know, they left, they cowardly left. And he destroyed the Philistines by himself. Man. And I mean, then you read of, of the other people. Man, a, a man that slew a lion on a snowy pit, and, 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 you know, all these things. Where did he get that from? Obviously from David. But here's what I want to share with most about this scenario. If you go to verse 15, uh, they were fighting against the Philistines. And uh, it says that, uh, let's start with verse 13. And three of the 30 chiefs went down and came to David in the harvest time under the cave of Agilon. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the belly of Rephaim. And David was then in a hold in, in the garrison of the Philistines. They were in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gates. Now, see, his three closest men, David was their king. Again, we're talking about types and shadows today. David was represented our king, Jesus. And these men were very close to him, the three. And they heard David mention something he desired. And you know what? We need to be so close to Jesus that we hear not just, see, we just don't interact with him and share with him what we desire. We need to hear from him what he desires. Amen? It might be to go somebody that you don't even like this unsaved that is very bitter. And, and, and he says, I, I need you to go share the gospel with them. It might be a, 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 you know, many things. And the three mighty men, verse 16, they broke through the host of the Philistines. You have to understand, the wall of Bethlehem, it was, the, it was very well secured, well guarded. And they drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, took it, brought it to David, and, and, and says, nevertheless, he would not drink of it because he said, be poor for me that I should do this in the blood of these men that were in jeopardy for their lives. Two things. Why did they do this? Because, man, their desire was ministered to the heart of their king. And see, God imparts power to us to minister to the heart of our king. But here's what's interesting. The, the well, it was so securely guarded, probably by hundreds of men. How'd these three guys break through? Well, you have to remember, it's the same guy that killed 800 Philistines. You wonder, if someone says, man, here's a guy that killed 800 of us at one time. Let's just, let, let them have it. Maybe that's how it worked. Maybe they just walked through, man, just like Jesus walked through. The people tried to kill him. I don't know. But see, when we're servants, when we are servants, we serve God. We serve our spouses. We serve our children. And children, you want to serve you? We serve one another in the body of Christ. I was so moved, you know, when... You know, and Terry shared, Simone shared. We serve one another. It's about serving. Peter was an apostle. But in 2 Peter 1, 1, he says, a servant and an apostle of Jesus. He was a servant before he was an apostle. Man, you got people in ministry. It's like, man, they want to be served because of their great gifts. That's not what it's about. Jesus said that he came to serve. Man. When you serve one another, wow, that's when Jesus comes. Amen. We've been anointed to serve one another. Glory to God. I was uh, discipling a young man. He's not from this church. and used, I, I don't have time to disciple people from other churches, but the Lord told me he's, he'll help this one church and he'll be a leader in that church. I said, okay. And man, we are at a Bible study this past weekend. I was, you know, just helping with something, man. He just shared something with me that, wow, it's powerful. He said, I was looking into Greek and this and shared something I never saw before. But this is life-changing. 
But man, this guy, said, he's, I said, man, you're a servant. You're, it's just neat. I believe our church, you're here as, as that word came forth, to love to serve. And as long as we enter into a place of serving, amen? Man, the anointing of God will come. Glory to Jesus. Okay. All right, let's look at a couple of things here. Boy, time goes so quick. Elijah and Elisha. Because of time, so we're going to do this quick. Elijah was, a, I mean, he's a great man of God. I mean, come on. Fire comes down from heaven. I mean, killed the prophets of Baal. I mean, raised the dead. You know what I'm saying? The widow's son. I mean, he's about, as, you know, just a tremendous relationship with God. I mean, a lot of people feel that, you know, Elijah will be one of the two witnesses, you know, referred to in the book of Revelation. Uh, some say Elijah and Enoch, some say Elijah and Moses, you know, not going to get into all that. But he was just a tremendous man of God. And he discipled Elisha. And, you know, 2 Kings 2, we'll go there real quick. It, it, it's, it, again, it's a type of how we enter into the anointing of God. And uh, in 2 Kings 2, they started, they started at Gilgal. And uh, Jesus, they started at Gilgal, and which means a place of equip, equipping. Let me find it here. Hallelujah. Second Kings two one, and, and equipping, you know, salvation, uh, you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit, on and on. And then they went to Bethel, which is the place of Bethel is church. It means church. And and then they went from church to Jericho, which means battle. And then they went to the Jordan, which means to be covered up, literally. It means to die to ourselves. But then, you know, Elijah says, you've entered into these places. So, and, and, you know, what do you want from me? Elijah says, I want a double portion of your spirit. See, most people think he asked for a double portion of, of the anointing on him. He did not. He asked for a double portion of his spirit, man. That, that which made him a servant, that's what caused the anointing to come. And Elijah said, man, yes, you've asked a hard thing. But if you see me when I go, it'll be done unto you. And all the sons of the prophets, they were around, but Elisha saw into the spirit realm, the chariots of fire. I, I mean, he saw Elijah being taken up, and the mantle fell to Elisha. All right? And he, you know, entered into doing twice what Elijah did. Now, what are we bringing in? Again, we're talking about impartation. Elijah imparted unto Elisha, right, his heart. What's it have to do with us? This is where, let's, let's get personal. Jesus, man, the most amazing thing. Jesus, man, he manifested the name to the apostles, right? I mean, he raised the dead in front of them, opened up the eyes of the blind in front of them, the crippled walked, and then, but see, Jesus did something just as powerful. Jesus did not only manifest the name of the Father in power, uh, but what he did, he discipled the apostles in a way that when he left, they would do the works that he did. Now, again, not because of their righteousness, but because he shed his blood, he had the legal right to impart to them his life. Ooh, I'm going to say that again. Because of his shed blood, he had the legal right to impart unto them his life. That's why the Spirit of God's in us. Ooh, that's why the new birth is so important, so the Spirit of God can be one with your spirit. Glory to Jesus Man, wherever in the, in the Old Testament, wherever there was blood, there was oil. They, they put the blood on the thumbs of the high priest and then the right to, uh, of his, uh, uh, on the big toe of his right foot representing obedience. But wherever they put blood, they put oil. And Jesus knows this. It's like, man, I'm going to shed my blood so I can impart through the Spirit of God. My life to my church. Ooh, 
of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. And see, as we enter into that, one, the pressure's off of us because it's not about you getting so righteous, God can now say, I can confirm you. It's the exact opposite. It's saying, God, I never is going to be righteous. My righteousness in the natural is as filthy rags, as it says in Isaiah. But because of the blood of Jesus, the gift of righteousness, the Spirit of God's in me. He didn't come in me because I did everything right. See, that's what the book of Galatians is about. He said, are you guys foolish that the Spirit of God come inside you because of your works? Did you get born again because you have achieved a level of righteousness? Does the Spirit of God live in you and manifest the life of Jesus? The answer is obviously no. Glory to God. So now we're in a place. Wow where life is so real because the same Holy Spirit that was on Jesus, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed, there's that word again, Jesus himself because of his righteousness with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the enemy, of the devil. Now the same Holy Spirit, who glory to God, is giving us revelation when we read the word like he did to Jesus. It's causing us to hear the voice of God like Jesus heard the voice of God. It's causing us to enter into faith that Jesus had. Causing us to enter into love that Jesus had. Woo, God! And the love of God, the faith of God, hearing the voice of God the revelation, power of God is all a gift. That's not based on us doing everything right, but simply saying, God, I want you. And I am not worthy of myself to get you. I want to live for you, but I'm not worthy to have you flow through me. But by the blood of Jesus, I am. Woo, glory to God. Jesus. You know, at the healing service, we had a young lady, Leah, she shared, a, I really need testimony. She's in a Messianic church, good friend of mine, pastors in, in Pittsburgh. And she was, uh, they're praying for people who get saved, and there's a professor from the University of Pittsburgh and uh, from South Korea, not saved, and during the service, Leah just speaks in tongues for about five minutes. And uh, the lady comes up afterwards and says, Leah, you're amazing. She said, well, I'm not really amazing. She said, where did you learn such fluent Korean? Leah's like, I don't know a word of Korean. But she spoke the message of salvation. Obviously it wasn't her because she didn't know what she said. (laughs) Amen? Who Glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Wow, that's fun, isn't it? Amen. But see, that's God. It's all about God. Amen. I want a good friend who helped disciple me, Mark Eppert. He's a large ministry, Southeast Asian Prayer Center. It's based in Indonesia. And uh, just a good guy. He, he, if you looked at him, you wouldn't say, well, he doesn't look like a preacher. What's a preacher look like anyways? I don't know. But just a tough guy, but he's won, about, he's won hundreds of thousands of people in Jesus, hundreds of thousands. And he really helped us a lot when we were in campus ministry, he'd speak at retreats for us all the time. And I, I ordained from the same church as he is, Day Spring. And uh, he just shared a story I thought was so neat. He was in Nepal, and, which is close to India. And it's when it was super closed. I mean, if you shared the gospel there, you could be imprisoned. But most of all, like if there was any person there that would even listen to you, they were the ones that they would put in prison or even even kill. I mean, we're talking, man, years ago. So he was there with a group of people from our church. And at the time, 
And uh, so he's out in the middle of nowhere. It's just like a Bible days. There's this guy feeding his flock. I think there's camels and stuff, you know, like at a well. You know what I'm saying? And then, uh, so Mark could speak some uh, Nepalese, but not out in the rural area because they didn't speak the, you know, the language he knew. So he's trying. He says, Lord, I'd love to minister to this guy, but he doesn't understand the word I say. It's not like charades, you know what I'm saying? And he just, his heart, his heart went out. See, he wanted to serve this man. He wanted to minister Jesus to him. And the Lord said, just start speaking in other tongues. He said, Mark said, what are you talking about? And then Mark thought, you know what, if I speak in English, he doesn't know what I'm saying. So if I, he just starts speaking in other tongues, and the guy starts speaking back. They had a conversation for about 25 minutes. Mark had no idea what he said. But when he was done speaking, the guy got down on his knees and prayed. And he heard him say, Jesus. Wow. Wow. See, I shared it because it's an example. That's tongues for a sign. It's an example of how big God is. So, yeah, I get a kick up here. I can't believe that. Why not? You're a believer, right? I can't believe that. Well, God's so much bigger, so much greater, so much more awesome than we could ever dream. So why don't we focus on him, amen, rather than on us? Oh, Lord, I can't minister because, I don't know, I, did something, I didn't do this yesterday. Or Lord, you know, man, I just don't feel it today. What's that have to do with anything? Or, you know, Lord, I was offended by somebody. I got to get over this. It's going to take me two months. No, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. We all miss it. There's no one in here that doesn't miss it. I miss it. We all miss it. We do the best we can. I'm not saying you go out and rob a bank tomorrow and, this, and then you say, I'm going to pray for the you know, sick tomorrow. You know? But we do the best we can. Glory to Jesus. When it's all about God, it's so good. It is so good. Let me show you a couple of things before. Go with me to Acts 9, and we're going to look at something with the ark first. First in Acts 9. Peter. <clears throat> and again, everybody points out the flaws of Peter. But you know what? I've never read about anybody but Peter walking on the water. I tell you, Peter had a wonderful heart towards Jesus. Glory to God. And he became, I mean, powerful. Amen. I mean, his shadow, Acts 5, was used to heal people. So in Acts 9, verse 32, it says, that it came to pass as Peter passed through at all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt Lydia. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years because he was sick of the palsy. And here's what Peter does. Peter says unto him, he doesn't pray for him. He says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ makes thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Where'd he get that at? He saw Jesus do this countless times. See, it's still Jesus today, isn't it? Jesus is the same today as he was 2,000 years ago. He's the same tomorrow as he is today. Woo, I love that. Woo. In this, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. Now let's get down to us. Can you do that? We can. But how come the body of Christ as a whole doesn't do it? Because, again, we look to ourselves so very much rather than to Jesus. Amen. Jesus will use you because Jesus is in you and he's the one that does the doing. Man, we were down at a place, Kathy and I, uh, Pastor Kathy and I were in a place uh, down Channel 40 a while ago. And there's someone we know down there, and I'll keep it confidential because she shared this with us. And 
I don't know if it's public, but so powerful. Her and her husband, uh, they had a daughter that was struggling with drugs for years, man. And they did everything they could. I mean, they loved her. You know, it wasn't because they did something wrong. Man, be, be careful not to judge people. Well, this happened because they did not. There's just a battle, okay? And man, struggle with drugs. And, I mean, since she was like 14, and now she's like 18, going on 18. They moved from place to place to get away from dealers, but she'd find a new dealer. And it was a bad deal. I mean, in and out of rehab. And uh, they moved to this one place, and she got involved. I believe it was heroin again. And uh, she took off, and uh, it was late, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. She didn't come back. And then somebody called her. It was, I don't know, it was the dealer or a friend of hers. And said, I think your daughter OD'd, and she's probably not. She died, probably. But their hearts were broken, but in their hearts, the Lord spoke and said, she's going to live and not die. So the husband goes throughout all the Pittsburgh, I mean, every restaurant you could think of, hang out and can't find her. And they're about to give up. I mean, what are you going to do? But Jesus, say this with me, but Jesus. Woo, but Jesus. Glory. There was something in their spirit. Isn't it good to be led by the spirit of God? Their natural mind is like, it's, it's over. But something in the mind of their spirit to keep on praying. So they're praying. But time's still going on. And then they had a, another child. I believe she was about nine years old at the time. Another daughter. And the daughter says, Mama, I had a dream. I had a vision. They're like, okay. I saw my sister. She's laying down. She's still alive. She's in such and such a place. In the, in the bathroom. And, and mom looks at dad, you know, and dad says, I'll go. But I think I've already been there. So he goes, and he finds her on the floor. It's a true story. Not cancer her back, and she's welcomed with Jesus today. But I shared this to say this. That little nine-year-old girl, Holy Ghost flowed through her. Woo, Jesus. What's that tell me? Lord, give me, a, give me the faith of a child. Give me the humility of a child. That child didn't say when this happened, well, look at me. She said, man, I'm so glad my sister's alive. Shh, Jesus. Mm. But you see something, she was saved nine years old, was imparted to her by the Holy Ghost. See, we're saying this to say this. Every day, we have needs. Every day. Man, to believe for someone we love to get better in some way. To help lead someone to Jesus to help bind up the brokenhearted, bring deliverance to the captives, amen? Just preach the year of Jubilee, the goodness of God. Every day, we need Jesus big time. Man, son, we need grace. We need to get out of bed. We need the anointing, man, just to face the world sometimes when you got something that you don't want to face. To actually facing it. And knowing that by the grace of God, you have the faith of Jesus in you to win. Whew. Amen. All right, last few minutes. Just look at something with the ark. Hebrews 9. Again, there's so much here. We just have a few minutes. You know, in the ark of the covenant, which is, uh, I mean, not much bigger than the size of this pope right here, pulpit. There are three entities. Ten Commandments, which is about the size of a notebook. And then there was um, Golden Jar of Manna, and then Aaron's Rod that budded. Ten Commandments represents you and I. 
being the righteousness of God in Christ. We're no, they're no longer under the law that we can't keep and did not keep. But the law is not fulfilled in us through Jesus Christ fulfilling it. Amen? The second Adam. So now, man, it's I, real simple. I, I just put that, you know, identity will share on this more. Maybe next identity, intimacy, power. So our identity is in the reality that Jesus has made us be the righteousness of God, his literal child, right? And because of that, the golden jar of manna represents Jesus. Gold represents you know, deity. Manna represents, Jesus said, even as my father sent manna down from heaven, I am the manna of today. And because we're born again, we have the ability to eat and drink of Jesus. Now, this is where the religious go crazy. This is why most of his disciples left him. He said, you have to eat of my blood, drink of my flesh. He's not talking about literally like they thought, cannibalism. He's talking about, he said, I'm talking about you in spirit. John 6.57 is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. Jesus said in the same uh, discourse where he shared the eating of his blood and uh, eating of his blood, drinking of his blood, he said, he who eats, even as I have eaten of the Father daily, I live by him. Jesus ate of the Father through the word, through his presence, through his voice, through his strength. So he that eats of me whoo, will live like I live. Wow. That's why the word of God is so important. Man, as Americans, it's so easy not to read the word. Everybody in their house has Bibles, so many of them. Man, these guys give out Bibles, and these guys give out Bibles and Gideons. And, but you got to read it, right? It's a privilege, not an obligation. It's eating at Jesus. I shared this before, but it's a good story. I was watching this cooking show. It's an Italian lady. I'm a half Italian. Lydia's Kitchen. Ever, ever read that? Hear that? All right, amen. Jan used to run a really good cook. All right. And, man, she started talking about having lamb, right? And she went to Italy and said there's a place where there's the best grass. And she said... The lamb eats of this. And she said, what? But you eat of the lamb. What's in the lamb gets in you. I mean, the vitality, the life. And I got so excited. Man, I started to shout. And Kathy, my wife, because she said, what is wrong? She said, seriously, she said, you listen to Andrew Womack? Who you listen to Kathy? Who you listen to? Because she knew I had the TV. I said, no, listen to Lydia. She said, what is wrong with you? I said, man, she's talking about eating of the lamb. She says, okay. You know what I'm saying? See, most people know on Passover, they slew the lamb. They put the blood over the doorpost. And that's salvation. But man, they got healed after they ate of the lamb. There's a lot of Christians that say, yeah, I'm saved by the blood, but they've never eaten of the lamb. What you eat, you will be. We have the privilege to eat of the word of God. This is Jesus. This word gets in us. His presence gets in us. His voice gets in us, even like it came today in a, a church. You know, I, woo, glory. And then we begin to live like him. Jesus. It's all about grace. We have the ability to assimilate this word because we're righteous through our born again spirit. We have the ability to assimilate, not religiosity, but Jesus. Third thing in that ark was Aaron's rod that budded. You know, Korah started a rebellion and anyways tried to come against Moses, end up, the earth end up, Opening up and swallowing him. <laughs> Not a good deal. But so he had Korah before he was swallowed up by the earth. He had everybody put in uh, these rods, almond rods. And he said, the one that buds is the one that's of God. And of course, Aaron's rod budded. 
The rod represents speaking the word, Isaiah 11. Jesus said, man, well, let's look at it real quick. In Isaiah 11, 42, 61, you know, a messianic prophecies of Jesus. And in Isaiah 42, scripture puts it this way. Glory to God. We can find it. Glory to Jesus. Mm, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to his name. Hallelujah, Jesus. It says, by the rod of his mouth, glory to God, he will destroy the wicked. He will not judge by what his eyes see, but by the rod of his mouth and by the breath of his lips. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We need to speak. But here's this thing that's like so exciting. We speak out of the faith that we have, that has been realized in us through eating of him. Ooh, glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah, Jesus. Man, as we close, this is personalized to us. We should be so excited. Really, we should worship Jesus in a way we've never worshiped him before. On earth as it is in heaven. When you get to heaven, are you going to shout? Then why don't you shout here? Uh-oh. When you get to heaven, are you really going to be excited? Man, it's going to be big time, right? Woo! Jesus. Big, 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 big time. Woo! Jesus. It's time to live now as this is real. Amen. Would you stand up with me? And what is real is that you and I are literal children of God. Having the God of the universe inside of us to infuse the life of Jesus into us. So when we speak, God can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Amplified says, who infuses his life into me. What we speak comes to pass. I just feel like the Lord's saying, know this, he will run to the sound of your voice. Because when you speak, it's the voice of his son, of his daughter. And you will speak out of a faith that has been burned into you. 